Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video episode on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian. Today I am taking a look at a pair of Swiss uh, SIG KE9 rifles and also a SIG uh, M29A rifle. These, these two developed into the 29A, at which point this whole series of rifles pretty much died out. Now, these were manufactured by SIG in Switzerland. They were designed by Pal Kirali, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, who is actually a Hungarian-born designer who spent a lot of time working for SIG uh, and had a bunch of interesting guns to his name. Um, you might recognize the San Cristobal carbine that was actually manufactured in the Dominican Republic. That's a lever-delayed blowback uh, 30 caliber submachine gun that he developed, pretty cool gun. Uh, and like I said, he did a bunch of work for SIG, including these rifles. Yeah. Now, all three of these rifles actually came out of the SIG factory collection. They sold off a bunch of their duplicates uh, a couple of years ago. And the, the largest serial number we know of is actually serial number seven right here on the KE-9. They might have made as many as 10, uh, not fewer than seven. Uh, we know of the location of four in total, uh, three actually in this collection, two here and one off camera. And there is one more in the SIG collection still. They kept one of each gun and just sold their duplicates. But this was a very low production gun, and I think you'll see why when we take it apart. They look cool, but boy, they're kind of a nightmare inside. Now, after the KE-9 was developed, there were also a small number of M29A rifles developed. That's this guy. This has no serial number. Uh, I don't think more than a handful of these were made, and this is a, it, it's an upgrade to the KE-9 in, in a couple of subtle ways, but they're actually pretty helpful when you try and take the gun apart. You'll see why they made the changes they did. So this, these are semi-automatic rifles. They are charger-fed. They have fixed magazines here, and SIG was making these. Presumably, they would have been thrilled to get a Swiss military contract, but they were also quite open to uh, foreign military contracts. Anyone in the world who was looking to buy a bunch of semi-automatic rifles, that's kind of the market that SIG was catering to. It's just this KE-9 uh, didn't turn out so well. Uh, it's interesting to point out, Pal Kirali was also the designer behind the SIG KE-7, which was a light machine gun, which did actually get some sales to China. Now, there isn't, there's basically no reference data available on these guns. The one book where you will find them is Automat Waffen by uh, Christian Reinhardt and Michael Amrein. And uh, in fact, two of these specific guns are pictured in that book, which is the pictures were taken from the SIG factory collection. Anyway, without further ado, let's take a look at the internals of these guns because they're kind of wild. All right, so one thing you will notice if you take a close look at a KE-9, since they were all fired in factory testing, they all have a band of wear right here uh, at the front end of the barrel where it comes out from the action. Now, when you notice that on several consecutive rifles, that gives you a clue as to how the action works. In this case, it's a short recoil gun. So recoil is one of the two typical uh, operating mechanisms for long guns, the other of course being gas operated. In this case, when the rifle fires, the barrel assembly recoils about a quarter inch. We can see that. Here's another clue for you. If you're looking at a rifle and you can see that the handguard is flush with the sight in the front, but there's an opening in the back, that is a clue that the action is going to reciprocate when it fires. And lastly, we can also see that on the action here. That is the full travel under firing. So the action is short recoil and then the locking mechanism is a tilting bolt. It tips up and it actually locks against this surface right below the stripper clip guide. So if I open this, you can see right there the bolt lifts up and down. There you go. So that's what actually locks. Now, this rifle's owner and I have a bit of a disagreement over how strong that really is. On the one hand, we have a big beefy bolt and a, a big chunk of a wide locking shoulder here. On the other hand, this is locking at the rear end of a piece that I could see the potential for this stretching over time. So this may have been part of the reason why this design was uh, 
not further developed. Uh, it could also be, and in fact, it's much more likely that this design was not further developed simply because it is nightmarishly complex inside. I can't even fathom what these would have cost to manufacture. When I lock the action open, like so, we can get a view inside. We have a fixed magazine there. Um, that holds probably 10 rounds, I would guess. These were made in multiple calibers. Uh, it's fairly typical of uh, SIG production from this time period that they were catering to a, any military force that was an interested customer. So they would make uh, rifles in, well, uh, this particular one is in uh, eight millimeter Mauser. There are also examples in, the next rifle we'll see is in seven millimeter Mauser. These were also made in 7.5 Swiss. So pretty much if you were a valid, a potential customer, they'd be happy to make the rifle for you in whatever military caliber you preferred. So one thing to notice here is when this is fully open, the bolt is actually tilted up at the back. When I pull it all the way open, the bolt lies flat. And that this is what you would see had you just fired the last shot. Uh, the bolt locks open when it's empty, and then this rear cover allows you to manually charge the bolt and to disassemble things. So, all right, so there's a little guide rail on the side of the bolt there, and my main uh, cover uh, locks into the bolt right there to allow you to pull it back, and then we have a little tiny button here that I can push to disconnect the carrier from the bolt, or the cover from the bolt. Now that that's disconnected, I can actually just lift the bolt directly out of the gun. Uh, very simple. What's not, what's not so simple is the machining on this bolt. Uh, this is not the worst piece of uh, Swiss bolt machining I've seen, but this is reasonably complex. We've got some fairly complicated tracks in there. Looking down into the top of the rifle, this is uh, a little bit more complex. This is certainly fragile and expensive by military standards. This right here is our hammer. This is a hammer fired gun. We've got a firing pin right here. That's our firing pin on the back of the bolt. So when you're firing this, what happens is recoil from the shot drives this whole barrel and bolt assembly backwards. The bolt's locked up here until at full travel, a cam, and it's probably connected to that little guy, pushes the bolt, the back of the bolt downward, which unlocks it. Once the barrel is at full travel, it stops, and then inertia uh, presses the bolt, or forces the bolt the rest of the way back, ejects the case, straight up, by the way, and then uh, the bolt cycles forward under spring pressure and chambers a new cartridge. All right, now, one problem that I want to point out, or potential problem when you're working on this rifle is the bolt can tip up like this at the end of travel. And if you're not familiar with exactly how to operate it, it's very easy to try and push this back into battery with the bolt tilt tipped up, which will cause it to jam up and be a gigantic pain in the rear to deal with. And that is one of the issues that they appear to have fixed with the 29A. So now let's take a look at the upgraded version. You can see this is marked M29A. The KE9 rifles do not have any sort of markings on them. The 29A is also distinctive for this set of diagonal finger grooves in the stock. All right, so this looks very much the same. It works exactly the same way. However, when we open the action up, the bolt does not tilt. The bolt stays in this linear travel all the time, which eliminates the possibility of having the bolt lift up and get jammed while you're trying to close it. So that is a very relevant and very helpful improvement to the action. Other than that, this gun is pretty much the same. There are a few uh, minor detail changes. The, for example, this uh, button was given much bigger checkering. This, the, the, the grasping tab on this side was made larger. Uh, easier to grab. So in theory, what you do is you hook this with two fingers and this finger pushes in on the button, which allows you to pull the receiver cover back. 
now. In the same way, I can disconnect from the bolt. Then we can pop the bolt up. And here is our 29A bolt. Same basic design, but it is a little bit simpler. So there can be a really subtle change that makes a significant difference in operation of a rifle, and this is a good example of that. Here, you can see this is serial number two. This is our KE9 bolt, which will tilt and get jammed. This is our M29A bolt, which does not. It's not serial numbered. And you can see there's the difference. This cam cutout is done slightly differently. And uh, it's a little detail like that that can make a big difference. All right, so just to do a quick comparison here, show a few of these features. On the KE9 up here, we have this rounded grasping knob. We have this with some very shallow checkering for gripping. And then our 29A, the improved version, has a, a bigger grasping knob, larger checkering to get an easier handle on. Uh, it's got these brackets on the back. Not entirely sure what those were for. Uh, may very well have been an experimental rear sight. Um, ultimately, it was replaced with the same type of rear sight as on the KE9s. Thanks for watching guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. This was certainly a unique opportunity to get a look inside the KE9 and its improved version, the 29A. So uh, if you enjoyed it, tune back into ForgottenWeapons.com for more early developmental self-loaders.